Um, my Lord, what I'd like to do is draw together the points on the second strand of my argument, so i.e. even an application of the rule needs a factual inquiry as to what's the least burdensome. I recognise that in addressing some of your Lordship's questions this morning, I've already developed a number of these points, and I'm loath to repeat myself, um, but I'll, I just want to sort of touch on the shape of the points, if I may, yes. in case there's anything I've missed. So if I do repeat myself, um, forgive me, but I should attempt not to do so. And then I need to turn on to the MVP shares point. Yes. Uh, and I'll return, if I may, to um, my Lord, Lord Justice Popplewell's question. That is my um, agenda for the afternoon. Um, and I would anticipate, I spoke briefly over the short adjournment with Mr. Laddie. Um, subject to your Lordship's questions, I would thought, anticipate being perhaps uh, a further hour or so, giving him some time this afternoon to um, open any position. Does that please your Lordship? Um, So I deal with the points in relation to the second strand of the um, argument about um, least burdensome. Um, page C25 in my skeleton, um, paragraph yes. 38, the heading is the, ju the judge erred in his application of the rule. Um, so it, it, it's necessary to determine in my submission what constitutes the least burdensome mode of performance. Uh, and I say, as I've submitted this morning, that that's going to entail a, a, a factual inquiry as to what would have been least burdensome um, that I um, touched on this morning and set out some of the factors as to the approach to be taken in relation to that. Um, insofar as the judge held um, as a matter of principle that least burdensome simply meant cheapest or earliest possible in a wrongful dismissal case. I say first that he was in error in doing so, and second that the cheapest question itself is not necessarily an easy answer question to answer, as I indicated um, this morning. Um, the reason why. Um, I say cheapest is not the right answer, is that least burdensome in my submission needs to take into account a broader consideration of the interests of the um, employer and what may in the circumstances be more or less burdensome to them. Um, given that the termination mechanisms in the contract are designed to cater to a number of situations, it would be wrong simply to say, well, which is the cheapest of these solutions? Because as I touched on in answer to questions this morning, the employer in bargaining for mechanisms for termination, and indeed the employer and employee in bargaining for mechanisms for termination, <coughs> will have a range of interests that they seek to cater for by those provisions. One will be, what are the sums that need to be? One will be, how long do you keep the benefit of this employee's service for? In some circumstances, it will be, uh, when are we able to get rid of Lord Strange, for instance, in misconduct-related um, dismissals? And there'll be, as my Lord, Lord Justice Bean indicated, there'll be concerns about competition with other um, employers in some circumstances, a range of factors that go into the decision making as to uh, even where one's taken as assuming that you're going to part company with an employer, uh, the right way to do it and the mechanism of, of doing it. Now, uh, so, uh, and also, uh, and this is a point that was addressed below in the claimant's own witness evidence, when one's dealing with a PLC or a substantial PLC, there are a range of reputational issues affect the um, business of the company, could affect the share price of the company that one needs to take into consideration in how one goes about handling um, the termination. All of those
may be weighed as amounting to matters that are burdensome, or more burdensome or less burdensome to the employer in, um, if it were deciding how to proceed. But of course, in the contract breaking case, in this case, in the wrongful dismissal case, the employer has deprived itself of the opportunity of making that assessment because it hasn't done that. It's proceeded on the wrong ground that there was a conduct case that justified um, summary termination, where indeed there wasn't. So one, then one comes to look at the world that never was, what the um, employer didn't do, um, uh, and assuming that it wants to terminate, but what are the mechanisms to be applied? One is left with the need to carry out an assessment of what would have been um, more burdensome or less burdensome, even applying the rule. And as I submitted this morning, again in answer to a question, um, you can't tell the answer to that question by in, in when one's looking at termination mechanisms in an employment contract. You can't tell what's the least burdensome simply by looking at the four corners of the contract, what the terms say, because the application of those terms to the, uh, in different factual circumstances may be very different. Hence my example uh, earlier on of the decision difficult decision of whether to make a pylon clause as to whether that might be cheapest or more expensive, depending on employment prospects for the employee over the course of um, what would have been the notice period. Um, and if you can't simply discern that from the four corners of the contract, then one needs, in my submission, to make a, a factual assessment of what the employer would have done. Uh, at the time of termination, if it had had the gross misconduct termination taken off the table as an available option. And I set out in the skeleton argument um, a range of <coughs> matters that um, may have been, maybe in the general case, advantages or disadvantages to an employer in exercising a pylon or giving um, notice. Uh, and that is an exercise that um, simply uh, uh, looking at the contract and saying, well, what's the least burdensome, is not readily carried out. Uh, and even applying the rule, as we saw in Lavrak, um, the court there recognised the point that the employer is not to be treated as cutting off its nose to spite its face. Um, And the extraneous factual circumstances, including, uh, I think the expression is used, contracts, uh, sorry, factors external to the contract, um, may be in play, including um, matters of choice on the part of the employer to what it can do. So we say the judge was, it, it, even if there's a rule to be applied, um, in applying that rule, the judge was wrong simply to look at, well, what in turn fact turned out to be the earliest termination or the cheapest termination and to strike out this head of claim as a matter of law and he ought to have allowed it to go forward to the type of counterfactual assessment that is available in other types of case for assessment for compensation uh, of damages for breach of contract that I've um, been referring to earlier this morning. The judge, and I've, I think I've either sufficiently, either orally this morning or on the page, developed some of those contrasts as to the factors that one needs to take into account. I do want to draw to your attention, though, in connection with the point that I make about uh, the effect on the market and the effect on the business of the whole, <coughs> using these different methods of termination. Um, the evidence that we had before the judge in relation to this, and Mr. McKenzie's own evidence in, in relation to this, because he dealt with it in his witness statement. Um, your lordships may have, may have seen there were three witness statements submitted on behalf of the defendant, uh, I'm sorry, the claimant below. One was Mr. McKenzie's own witness statement, uh, 
One was from Mr. Jennings, that's his instructing solicitor who, my instructing solicitor who sits behind me, uh, and a third from a Mr. Durkin, who is the chief executive of Senkos, one of the brokers, um, uh, who gave evidence about the um, shares point. Mr. McKenzie's own statement is at starts at 142. And he deals at page 140, S 145, from paragraph 19 onwards, through to 38 on page S 149, um, with factors that a the leadership of a PLC, um, in his experience would have regard to and would need to have regard to in making a decision as to whether to terminate. So you see at 19, um, what page you on? Uh, S145, my lord, paragraph 19. I, I'm so sorry. Yep. So he starts by saying he understands the argument that in the event of primary submissions on his behalf being uh, not accepted, the court may have to consider what's the least burdensome approach for the defendant to have taken. Um, defendant argues that's a simple financial exercise, fails to understand the dynamics of play within a large list of companies. And he goes on then to give evidence over the next few pages um, where he sets out um, some of the factors that need to be taken into account by reference to his own experience and his experience of, of others in the market. Mr. Mansfield, you, you, you say in your skeleton argument at <coughs> um, 41B, the claimant's dismissal did in fact cause the share price to fall sharply. Yes. See share price charts. W would it be fair to say that um, a neutral way of putting it would be following the claimant's departure from the company, the share price, share price Fell sharply. There's no, there's no finding of fact by the judge or anyone else that it was the fact the claimant had been dismissed for gross misconduct which caused the share price to fall, as opposed to the, on any view, lamentable circumstances of his departure. Well, you're right, my lord. Uh, I agree with two things. First, the way you put it is indeed a more neutral way of putting it, although my submission, with respect, is not the right way to put it. That's not our case. Second, there is not such a finding by the judge, although you put your finger on an interesting question. First, the judge actually makes the contrary finding about the effect of the share price. Um, well, he makes a finding about the effect of um, the share price. I don't think he expressly deals. Well, he does. If one looks at C80, he refers to two things. At paragraph 52, he says, it's clear on this evidence, and I find that the share price continued to be adversely impacted by factors in large part unrelated to strategic decisions being taken by the applicant's leadership team. And then at paragraph 54, um, the applicants would still have been obliged to issue a prof this profit warning, even without Mr. McKenzie's dismissal, which I find would have had a negative impact on the share price. Um, so there isn't a finding in my favour on the effect of the dismissal on the share price. Um, but my lord, let's bear in mind the exercise that the court was engaged on. This was a strikeout application um, at a summary stage without disclosure where the judge was not in a position to be making findings one way or another. All but, but, but the counterfactual, again, I must be a little bit careful here not to 
simply say, well, what might have been the effect on the share price of sacking the chief executive for gross misconduct when you weren't entitled to and he wasn't guilty of gross misconduct. If the counterfactual is that he would have been retained, then that's one thing, but that's not this case. The counterfactual in this case is that what uh, would, would, would have happened uh, in your alternative scenario of giving 12 months notice is that the company would have announced that the chief executive and chairman was standing down with immediate effect because he had written saying uh, that he wasn't well enough for an indefinite period to carry on his duties uh, in a way that had resulted uh, in a most unfortunate incident at the Penny Park Hotel. Uh, whether or not it amounted to gross misconduct, it certainly involved, on his own account, uh, a, a drunken uh, occasion on which he had uh, assaulted uh, a fellow employee in front of others. Uh, accordingly, uh, so the announcement goes in the counterfactual, uh, Mr. Breakwall will be taking over, or someone will be taking over, shortly as chief executive officer, and uh, will remain as chief executive officer uh, for uh, the foreseeable future, and Mr. Uh, McKenzie will be on garden leave for uh, a substantial part of his uh, remaining 12 months, uh, possibly all of it. Now, would there be much difference in, in effect of, on the share price of that um, we've sacked him for gross misconduct? And if so, why? Well, first, yes, I say. Um, why? Um, well, uh, and also, my second point, I'll come to why if I may in a moment, but also, uh, I, I don't accept that is the appropriate counterfactual. I can see that it's a counterfactual, but there are a number of ingredients that uh, would have to be determined as to whether that would have happened or not. Um, so much of what your lordship uh, puts into the counterfactual as to what the announcement would have been wasn't in fact announced to the market, even in the circumstances where um, he was actually dismissed. The AA effectively just announced that he'd been dismissed for gross misconduct without going into any of the details that your lordship puts into to the announcement. Um, uh, but I accept that it would have announced that um, he was uh, needing to, he would be outside of the business um, on sickness absence for a period of time. Uh, and it may well have announced that he was um, on notice. All right, but let's strip it down. So suppose, suppose that we're, all we're concerned about is the effect of the share price of him hmm. not, not being there, or no longer being the chief executive. That's so for an indefinite period. Uh, even on the counterfactual? Well, we say there's a very big difference between simply announcing to the market um, chief executive has been dismissed for gross misconduct and saying he's having a period of, uh, he's out of the business because he's taking a period of convalescence on grounds of ill health. And he has written to us to say that he simply can't carry on. And therefore we've given notice uh, that uh, Will only will only stay for a maximum of twelve months, and we're unable to say whether, for any of that period, he'll be fit to resume his duties. Well, in relation to the letter, I can only repeat my submission as to the effect of that it has to be looked at in the circumstance in which it was written. Um, both uh, Mr. Mackenzie's ill health and the situation he was placed in by uh, the way in which he was being treated, and. Uh, I say that's a matter of factual, uh, a factual evaluation that would need to be considered of what the effect if the, um, the There are two elements about his leaving, however it's dressed up. One is that he's going, and the other is the circumstances leading to his going. Uh, if the market's working properly, the share price will respond to the fact that he's no longer there because the means why he's leaving doesn't really make much difference. And if the, if the market thinks he's the best thing since sliced bread, 
that will have one impact. If the market just thinks he's, it was about time the AA got rid of him, it will have another impact. And I've, I'm putting almost the same thing as my Lord to you. Does it, does, it, does it really make much difference? Well, that's a possibility, my Lord, but I, I don't think it follows. And I don't think it's something that one can uh, take for granted. Well, but the point, the, the point being that what is common to any speculation about how it might be announced is he's gone. Well, indeed, and that's a factor that one would have to untangle from other factors. But we're, not at, we're not at, sorry, Mr. Manchin, we're not at this stage assessing damages, nor was the judge. All this goes to is whether it is obvious, as Mr. Laddy uh, argues it is, that the pylon clause was the least, less, bur sorry, the less burdensome um, option for the company. And it, it, it you're, you're, you are saying that it is a tribal issue as to whether uh, the board, if properly advised that this was not the gross misconduct case, would have said, well, um, uh, uh, nevertheless, we're not, we're not going to use the pylon cause because the damage from um, uh, announcing that Mr. Mackenzie had left with immediate effect <coughs> would be so much greater than um, uh, announcing that uh, Mr. Mackenzie um, uh, is currently incapable of performing his duties and he may resume at some point during the next 12 months, but at the end of 12 months he will cease to be. Yes, I am saying. You're saying that that's the issue which has to go to trial. I am saying. Okay. Got that. <coughs> so can I just check if my I thought there was a note coming my way. Can I just turn my back from yes. this to see whether there is Yes. Um my Lord, yeah, I, so I am saying that. Um, what I say is, first, the, the judge applied a hard and fast law um, that he shouldn't have done. So he cut us off without getting as far as that factual inquiry. But second, on the facts of this case, uh, there was a factual inquiry that um, justified being carried out. set out in the skeleton some of the features of it and you've seen Mr McKenzie's evidence about it and there was a great deal more I can say we're not a repetition of those points um, I diverted you from taking us to the evidence before the judge you'd taken us to page 145 paragraph 19 and following with Mr McKenzie did you want us to look at any particular part of it? Um, I'm grateful my lord um, well, it's, it goes to the points that I've already been making about the delicacy of the situation in terms of the effect of a termination in different circumstances on reputation. You can see, um, if I can draw your attention to 20 through to 21. And then 24 and 25. 25 seems to proceed from the premise that what one's talking about is removing executive with a high profile against their will. Yes. That's not what we're concerned with in this case, is it, on, either, on any hypothesis? 
Well, they are, because he was sacked for gross misconduct, so that certainly wasn't what he wanted to happen. Having he said that he, he wanted to resign. Well, having been told that he was going to be dismissed mm. if he didn't. I mean, that's a, there's, a, there's a legal battle commonly fought out in the employment tribunals where the, the, uh, the resign or be sacked scenario amounts yeah. to a term dismissal in any event. So mm. certainly, I mean, as I've indicated this morning, his, his resignation letter seen in its circumstances not to be taken as him demonstrating a will not to go on. But it was at the time. He wanted them to act on it. Um, so why should we act, we act differently? Unless you're saying it's a fraud. No, I'm not saying it's a fraud, no. but it was entered into in circumstances of the pressure placed upon him and in circumstances of his ill health and inability um, at, at that period of time, which he'd uh, given the company psychological evidence of. So to, to treat him as someone who had decided that he wanted to um, resign is, in, in my submission, not the right way of looking at it and would need evaluation of the evidence at trial rather than simply taking it at face, face value. Well, I don't know much about them rules of the stock exchange and so forth, but um, would the would the company have been entitled to conceal from the public the fact that he'd written a letter resigning his job as chief executive and, and resigning from all his directorship? Um. Well, if we look at what happened, that's not what they told. Um, they no, no, they, they, no. They, they, we're, we're going on the, on the counterfactual that they hadn't um, uh, made a decision to dismiss him. Um, no, but my lords, it, it's, it's not a, in a sense, it's not a counterfactual because they didn't say we've dismissed him for gross misconduct and he sent us a letter saying that he wants his note not capable mm. of going on. They just said they dismissed him for gross misconduct. So, they didn't regard that as a material additional fact to add at that time if they'd announced that he was on notice um, in the circumstances of your lordship. But it would, it would have been in the counterfactual in which they were not relying on gross misconduct, in which they would have had to have given an explanation for his departure. Well, and you're, you're, I think, are saying to us the explanation which would have been given would have been limited to uh, he's unable to carry on as a result of ill health without the addition and he has asked to give up the job on grounds of ill health because he says he's unable to carry on and that's the, that's the, the, the narrow distinction you're drawing I think yes that would be a matter for inquiry my lord's question is whether in those circumstances the second element of that would actually be something which in a publicly listed company could be repressed um, well, that is his question. I, I don't have a, an immediate answer to that. It would be need to be a matter of um, that would need to be explored. Well, common sense suggests that that um, they they couldn't possibly pretend to the general public that he was, as it were, still at his desk. They would at least have had to uh, reveal that for whatever reason he would not be. Forming any of the any of his duties for the foreseeable future. Yeah, I accept that. Uh, and do you say it's less damaging to do that than to say he's been dismissed for gross misconduct? Yes, certainly. Yeah. And if yeah. you're saying, well, the chief executive's having a period away from his desk, to use your uh, uh, phrase, due to his ill health and his convalescing, that's very different. Uh, I accept, my lord. Smith's remark that one component is the mere fact of departure and the fact, but even on that analogy, um, one doesn't know that there's a, a question to be addressed as to uh, at what time and whether he will come back, but even on notice for handover and um, continuity, that's, but we say it's the, it's the sharp break, unexpected, um, that 
whether that's by way of gross misconduct or a pylon to avoid gross misconduct, what we say is what has the impact, and that's something that needs to be explored, needed to be explored on the facts. Don't worry now, but have we got in our bundle somewhere the, the announcement of the departure that was in fact made? I don't think we have. I'll be proved wrong by my learned junior on this. I'm not sure we have the actual announcement, but we have the um, market reaction to it. Can I just take a moment just to... Uh, it's just yes. that you asserted a moment ago that all they announced was that it was for gross misconduct without any of the details. Can I just assist on that point? My recollection is, forgive me for getting to my feet, is that they clarified that it wasn't for, for financial Yes, because there was there was some speculation as to what it was about. My Lord, if one looks, for example, at supplementary two eight eight, which is from Morgan Stanley, <coughs> we can see that Mr. Smith of Morgan Stanley statement out saying Bob McKenzie has been removed by the board as executive chairman for gross misconduct with immediate effect. Whilst it's not clear what this is exactly, it's notable the CFO is still in place, suggesting it's not a numbers issue. So, whilst I can't for the moment point to the announcement, it can't have made clear to... 287, two, similar to what Mr Landy said, although it's, it's second-hand, but uh, Bob McKenzie, yeah. Executive Chairman, has resigned from gross misconduct. We do not believe it's fraud. Indeed. Yes, all right. Thank you. Then I, I think that covers the ground that I wanted to address you on, on the... What's the least burdensome? Yes. Point. I'll just take a moment to check my skeleton. Um, and I, I just pick up on the letter, I, if I may. I, I've, you've heard my submission on that, but I just draw attention at um, paragraph forty-five of my skull and C29 um, that the um, defendant's own case is that that letter didn't reflect the claimant's true position because it's described as a naked attempt to manipulate the situation in their, um, on their case. Um, and maybe now is a convenient moment as any to uh, return to my Lord, Lord Justice Popplewell's question about a separate resignation as a director. Yes. Um, I, mean, I, the, uh, I, I think, my lord, the answer to your question is that in order for him to perform his employment duties, it didn't necessarily require him to be appointed as a director of those companies. I don't see why it would have been necessary for him to do so. So I don't think there was an issue of him being in breach of his employment contract by having resigned. Um, Which was AAPLC, the holding company. Yes. And he's and saying that a chief executive officer and chairman can perform those functions without being a director of the holding company. Most unusual, isn't it? Well, I agree that it would be unusual, but I don't think it would put him in breach of contract by. Well, he wouldn't be able to be party to any of the discussions at the board meetings as to the strategy of the. have to report to it and be told by the board what its decisions were. Uh, I have to say that strikes me as unreal. Um, well, my other point, the other point I wanted to make was this, that if one looks at 280, um, supplemental. supplemental 280, yes. yes. Um, 
he's not, although your lordship is quite right to say there are two resignations, one as from employment and one as uh, from directorship of the companies, they are linked. The last paragraph on 280 says, because I'm unable to perform my employment duties, I've therefore, with this letter, included a letter of resignation from my various directorships of the A group. So he's not independently resigning from that. You have my submissions on the effect of, of this letter. And if the court were to disregard or find it arguable that one should disregard this letter, then I say the same applies to the directorship. He's only resigning that because of the 280. Well, I think my, my lord's point was that um, uh, that might be applicable to the uh, resignation from employment. Which anyway, that's your that's your case. It's a matter of employment law, but it's a matter of company law. If you write, dear sir, that I hereby resign from my directorship of the company, that's it. You resign. Um, uh, and it doesn't it doesn't make any difference uh, what the what the response is as to the the the, the effect of the letter he says I hereby resign as chief executive and chairman sorry the first letter I he hereby resign my Employment as Chief Executive and Chairman of AA Developments Limited. Um, and the second letter is I resign my directorships. There are some companies, I suppose, where the Chief Executive is not a member of the board. Um, perhaps may be invited to attend board meetings member, but if you resign as chairman, you resign as chairman, haven't you? You can't, you absolutely can't be chairman of, chairman of a company's board without being a director. Well, I'd be surprised if there are any public list, publicly listed companies who don't have the chief executive on their board. I may be wrong. Um, I, I, I agree with my Lord Lord Justice Bean's point that you can't be a chairman of the board without being a member of that board. But the role that he was originally engaged in uh, was exec executive chairman. So the label is chairman. He's carrying out executive functions uh, in, in the company. I say it uh, would have been possible for him to do so um, without being formally appointed as a director. But my lords, this is not a point that was has been live in the case until today. That it certainly true. wasn't the basis upon yeah. which the judgment under appeal um, proceeded. The contract of employment says the company shall employ the executive and the executive shall serve the company as executive chairman. On the terms set out in this agreement, the executive shall report to the board. may not be the most important point of the case. So, carry on. my lord, that brings me to the MVP shares point. Yes. Uh, I deal with that in the skeleton argument at C30. Uh, and I'll deal with it this afternoon, if I may, relatively briefly. Um, the, the issue here, my lord, is, is if I just describe it in outline as this. Um, my client had um, a large number of what were called management value participation shares. Um, those were convertible into ordinary shares in the company if certain share price thresholds were met on one or more of three trigger dates, the third, fourth, and fifth anniversary of the um, listing of the company. And that, for our purposes, June 17, June 18, June 19. Um, when he, his employment was summarily terminated, he was treated as a bad lever within the definition of the Articles of Association. 
and therefore all of those MVP shares were forfeit. Um, the question of whether or not the company was entitled to terminate and the separate but closely related question of whether or not he was a bad leaver and therefore they were entitled to forfeit the MVP shares are all matters for trial and that wasn't disputed by the defendant um, below. The summary judgment application that they pressed on um, Mr. Metzer and that they found in their favour and we appeal against is about quantification of damages, about value in those MVP shares. Because it is true as a matter of fact that the MVP shares did not hit their target prices on any of the three relevant dates, etc. Um, so, but my client's case is uh, a loss of a chance that had the had his employer not uh, wrongfully dismissed him and below he said had they not caused him personal injury but that's no longer a live case um, there is a realistic chance that the shares will have hit the um, relevant share threshold to release some of at least of the most substantial value in those shares and the case argued below well is that that was fanciful there was no realistic prospect of the shares hitting the target because of the gap between their actual performance and their final performance so my case my clients is that uh, had he not been terminated in the way that he was accepting on the wrongful dismissal case that they would have terminated but on notice um, and we say on notice therefore in a more managed way and with a different outcome um, there is a realistic prospect that the shares would have hit the um, relevant target uh, I accept that uh, that case is entirely contingent upon my client's employment continuing after the 1st of August 2017. So if I lose on the first point, I accept that um, I must lose on the second point as well, because um, he would have been out of the business at the same date um, scenario. So the question is whether there's a realistic prospect of showing that had they not summarily terminated, gross misconduct dismissal or pylon, uh, the circumstances of, in which he remained over the notice period would have given a realistic prospect of the shares hitting the relevant target. That's the shape of the case. The judge found that the prospect of that was fanciful. We say he impermissibly conducted a uh, mini-trial on the issue uh, and he got too far into the competing evidence as to what was to happen to what might have happened in relation to the shares. And we see that in two passages that I've already taken your lordships to in the core bundle in his judgment. At page C80. 52 and 54 where he makes a, a number of findings as to the factors affecting the share price um, and we looked at these a few minutes ago but I say that indicates his error of approach it wasn't his role at that time to make findings it was to consider whether there was a more than fanciful and arguable case for summary judgment purposes, that there was a loss of the chance of hitting the share price. And of course, it, it's completely inappropriate to approach the evidence on that basis because we haven't had disclosure, we haven't had the opportunity to put in expert, proper expert evidence, and the court didn't hear from any witnesses. So he embarked upon the wrong exercise, we said and failed to have regard to material evidence uh, on my client's behalf, not least uh, in all of those three witnesses' statements that I referred to, that indicated the 
was a real estate prospect, um, not least with Mr. Durkin of Senkos, which is one of the brokers in Um So, is, is it over simplistic to say that there are really two elements to your, your case on this? One is that uh, that there is a sufficient prospect for the loss of the chance threshold uh, that if he'd stayed, his strategy would have been adhered to rather than the, the strategy that was announced by Mr. Brakewell in February 2018. And secondly, that if that had occurred and his strategy had been adhered to, that gave rise to a sufficient prospect of the share price hitting the trigger points. No, I don't think that is overly simplistic as to a key strand of it. The other, the other strand of it is um, the dismissal in what I was talking about earlier in a slightly different context. The dismissal itself had an impact on the share price, we say. Um, quite apart from the change in strategy, that had a negative impact on the share price that if it had been handled... For, for which you have to say it was the fact that he was dismissed for gross misconduct rather than the fact that he would, he would in the counterfactual, have been stepping down for an indefinite period. Yes. That, that made all the difference to, the, to that share price. Indeed. Profit. Yes. That is, that's the shape of the, uh, the case. And we point to... And sorry, just uh, so if I can clear my mind on it. The, the, in relation to the element of whether his strategy would have prevailed in the counterfactual, it is that his strategy would have prevailed, notwithstanding that it was necessary to appoint a new interim CEO and, uh, uh, in fact, actual CEO, it having been agreed in April that there would be a new separate person in that role uh, over an indefinite period. Uh, on your case, at least six months whilst he was incapable of playing any part. And that there would then have been a maximum of six months in which he would play a practical role as uh, chairman, but not CEO, followed by his departure thereafter. Yes. So uh, it, it, the, the case is that he would have been able, uh, or might to the relevant standard, have been able to ensure that Mr. Brakewell didn't implement the strategy which we know he or the management under him thought was desirable um, by virtue of his being after an inter interruption of six months there as chairman for six months. Well, my lord, yes. I don't shrink from that. That's, that's, that, that's the factual yeah. hypothesis. And that's what we say needed to be determined at trial and was not suitable for summary termination. The, the second trigger point in June 2018 uh, was within the 12 month notice period and therefore within the period that we say even if he departed on notice he would have still been uh, an employee and in the latter part of it um, we say returning to to function um, and although I'll, I don't propose to belabor the detail of the evidence my lord I'm sure you wouldn't thank me for that but just so you see the shape of the point although the judge accepted my learned friend's submission about the chasm between the actual share price and the um, target share price. Um, first, as at July 2017, the what had been a, a four-year strategy to turn around the company was partway through and was bearing dividends, both metaphorically and literally, because um, that was one of the changes in strategy, the change in the dividend policy. And at that time, a matter that we say the judge only paid passing reference to and didn't properly grapple with, there had been a, a, an offer um, to purchase the company and take it private at, at uh, a share price of up to 370, we believe. We haven't seen the document. Where, where do we see the evidence of that? <coughs> Can you just remind me where we see the evidence of the offer? The evidence of the offer, well, it's referred to in Mr. McKenzie's own witness statement, mm -hmm. and one can see it referred to in a document that the defendants relied on from Mr. Clark, which is called the Crisis Memo. Mm -hmm. So in Mr. McKenzie's witness statement, 
at that starts at one four two. I think it's at one six one. Yes, um, supplementary one six one. Um, So, my lord, you'll see at 102 that Mr. Mackenzie, working from memory, refers to an offer in May or June of 2017 from a, a private equity investor called Hellman and Friedman, which he recalls it being between 320 and 38 and 350. The target price in June 2017 um, was 351. Uh, I think in June 2018 it was 383. 393. I'm so sorry. So, um, but that was his recollection. Obviously, we've had no disclosure, and as he explains elsewhere in his statement, he's not kept any of his books and records. But Mr. Goldring doesn't seek to controvert that in his responsive statement. I don't believe so. Right? No. But we can see a reference to it at 267, also in the supplementary bundle. This is a, the document starts at 264 the AA and existential crisis in the making part two um, which is relied on the defendant for Mr. some criticism by Mr. Clark but if we go to 267 um, <coughs> we can see a trace of this Lupton so in the second paragraph on that page Lupton is the person who you've just seen Mr. McKenzie described as being the person who advised that the offer that was made was too low um, and then there's a reference in the middle of the paragraph. So Ms. Clark's talking about selling, but he says, my personal belief, backed by Senkos and Liberum, is that a bid pitched in the range 350 to 370 would win. Hellman's, that's the private equity company that Mr. McKenzie recollects was involved, range was 330 to 370. So that points to an offer being made by Hellman's in the range 330 pence to 370 pence. Um, and it's consistent, it's, it's higher than the figure that Mr. McKenzie recollects, um, but it's consistent with it. Um, and there's a ref it's consistent with the fact that, as Mr. McKenzie says, there had been some involvement by Mr. Lupton. So we say the evidence points to there being an offer of up to 370, which Mr. Lupton um, had indicated was too low. But we don't have Mr. Lupton's report or any of the other documents about it. So how does this work? Is the idea that uh, this offer, which was not accepted, would be replicated and therefore the share price would go up? Or that this is a view of Senkos and whoever it might be that um, the offer was low, so you just leave it to the market and hope that it comes up by June 2017? What? How does it work? Well, we say, first, it's an indicator of the belief in value in the business right. as at due, as at <coughs> the period shortly before the termination. 8th of April 2017, I yes. think is the date of the memo. Yep. Um, second, of course, had there been in due course such a purchase, that would have triggered an entitlement under the, um, uh, to convert the MVP shares in any event, regardless of the market rate at the time. We say it is material evidence to the question, to goes against the proposition that there was an unbridgeable chasm 
between. Sorry, so I, I miss something. Does the MDV scheme mean that if there's a bid, then the trigger prices are irrelevant? I thought you, I thought you were saying a moment ago that if there had been a bid, that would have uh, entitled the MDV shares to vest at value. Yes. Irrespective of this, uh, of the share price. Yes. Sorry, contingent on I think the size of the. The size of the bid. That's part of the, 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 the articles st that establish the MPV scheme. Is it? Yes. You, you may need to. I see some shaking of heads on the other side, so we, we may need to drill, drill down into that. To be clear, I'm not saying a bid at any price whatsoever, but I'm saying that if there's a the change of control, if there's a um, purchase, is then the terms of that trigger the MVP rather than the actual share price in the market at the time. So any change of control triggers the MVP? Yeah. But I don't think we have that, I'm not sure we have that particular provision of the articles in the, the bundle that we can set. It was before the judge below. And I seem to remember that there were some submissions about that, to the effect of that below. But I can hunt that out. That's a new point. It wasn't. I, I hadn't seen anything in the judgment or the argument below, which was that there was sufficient for an allied maples loss of chance of a bid at whatever price, resulting in a change of control, which would have boosted the shares to vest. Was it? Was that argued below? Well, I don't think we said. There are detailed provisions on the, that page. I'm just looking at one eight two. You had a specific. You had specific provisions in the articles about change of control, performance conditions. Yeah, my recollection, my lord. Now I have to go back to my note. Is that this was a point that we did have some discussion about below, and I made the point that had there been uh, an acceptance of an offer, that that. I think we had a discreet, there was an issue raised about whether that would have led to the shares being forfeit anyway, or as in fact I submitted as the case that the MVP shares would have been triggered in any event. In that circumstance. We, we, may not, we may not have the relevant bit of the article to deal, uh, deal with that. Well, we can certainly get them. They're in the exhibits to the statements below, so we can certainly um, produce those, and I can make that point good. The difficulty I have, sorry. So, forgive me, Mark. The difficulty I have is, where's the pudding? The, pr the proof the pudding is going to be in the eating. And the fact you've got a possible offer, which people say is not what they would wish to accept, and no actual, no subsequent offer that comes to fruition. Uh, I'm just not sure how much weight you put on this. Is it simply that you say these are factual matters that should be taken into account and need a trial? Yes. Yeah. Um, and regardless of the actual prospects of a an offer uh, coming through after this, we say that was a real indicator of value in the business. And had there not been a change of strategy, uh, the dismissal and the change of strategy, and I said, my Lord's a summary of the outline of my case, was a realistic prospect that uh, the 2018 trigger would have been hit. And that's why one comes back to my Lord Justice Stuart Smith's first question on this. If, if that's relied upon as an indication of the value that one particular private investor would have put upon it in making a bid, it doesn't help us at all because the share price was what the share price was. Uh, if uh, it's uh, relied upon uh, as an indication that there was at least a chance that there would have been a bid, uh, and that that would have had the usual effect on the share price uh, of increasing it to the trigger points, uh, it runs up against the pudding difficulty. There was no such bid. And uh, there's no reason to think uh, it'll be said that there would have been a bid any more with Mr. McKenzie there for six, month six to 12 than in fact occurred. Well, 
we say that's a matter of, of factual investigation. There wasn't one, I accept. But I have the circumstances in the summer of 2017 shortly after this appeared in difference. Maybe there's a, a court find that there's a realistic, there's a real chance, we say. The court may find that there might have been. That inquiry has been uh, closed off. I mean, we don't know. I mean, we know what we read in the market, but we don't know what internal approaches there might have been or what the reaction to this might have been uh, post termination, of course, because my client was out of the business. So, in short, you accept that if you lose on issue one, then the um, uh, Laverack applies that the board. Could and probably would have adopted the pylon clauses as the less burdensome means of performance, then issue two doesn't arise because Ms. McKenzie would not have been there in June 2018. But if you win on that, um, then all you have to show is loss of a chance. The lo loss of a chance is not to be valued nil, there are some difficulties, but they, those are matters for trial. Yes, so That's what it comes to. Yeah. I turn my back for a moment. Of course. And unless I can assist you further at this stage. Thank you very much, Mr. Hello. Mansfield. Please, my lord, I'm just going to plunge straight into ground one, if I may. Yes. Uh, and can I just introduce it by summarising our case as follows? Mr. Metz of QC was, we say, correct to strike out the claimant's wrongful dismissal claim for ancillary benefits for two principal reasons. First, as a matter of law, Damages in a claim for wrongful dismissal are calculated by reference to the earliest date when the employer could lawfully have dismissed under the contract. Where, as in this case, there is a pylon clause, the employee's damages are limited to what was payable under the pylon clause. Exercise of that clause would have brought about a lawful termination of the claimant's employment on the same date as it was assumedly wrongfully terminated. The second reason why Mr Metzer was correct was that even if we are wrong about this being a matter of law, on the facts of this case, if the law permits any factual inquiry whatsoever into the question of what would have been the least burdensome mode of termination, there is only one answer available, namely exercise of the pylon clause. When asked what does the AA do in a counterfactual, hypothetical situation where it does not dismiss Mr. McKenzie for gross misconduct? It exercises the pylon clause. I will develop those submissions uh, as follows. My first, you know, my first heading is facts. I appreciate my, my learned friend uh, did set the scene for this appeal. And I appreciate that we are arriving in this court after a strikeout slash summary judgment application, so there are no facts that have been found. Nonetheless, there is substantial common ground in terms of the factual position. If I, if I may, just accentuate a couple of elements which um, may not have been obvious to the casual observer from Mr Mansfield's uh, opening. Mr McKenzie was employed in a dual capacity. Chairman and Chief Executive Officer. I would uh, assume that it's common ground 
that the highest standards of personal behaviour were expected of him in those dual roles. He went on a company away day to Pennyhill Park Hotel uh, on the 24th of July 2017. Mr Mackenzie drank too much. I should make it absolutely clear that I'm not going to say anything that is not common ground. And in the early hours, between uh, 12.44 and 12.49, and we can be precise about this because it's captured on the CCTV, he engaged in a physical assault upon a subordinate employee that lasted approximately two minutes involved him pursuing him around a public bar area, throwing <coughs> punches, most of those missed, I have to acknowledge. It was, it is common ground, unprovoked and unjustified, and it is also common ground that the subordinate employee did not respond in a violent way at all. In other words, throughout this episode, he adopted a pacifist stance. On the face of it, this was disgraceful behaviour, obviously constituting gross misconduct. Let me just pause there and pause to acknowledge that the amended particulars of claim dispute that. They say that assuming it was deliberate, it wasn't serious enough to constitute gross misconduct. If that, had all been, if that was all this case was about, we would have applied for summary judgment on that point as well. But we say it's obviously, on the face of it, gross misconduct. Obviously justifies summary dismissal. This would have been the case if the claimant was a roadside assistance driver or one of those people that you see at the motorway service station uh, offering AA membership, if they had been involved in a fight, they would have been dismissed. And the same must we say be true of the chairman and chief executive officer. The only thing that means that this case on wrongful dismissal is going to trial is the claimant's contention found in his amended particulars of claim that he was, at the time of the assault, acting in an automotive state. And we accept, rightly or wrongly, we accept that's a matter that can only be determined at trial. If he actually bears no responsibility whatsoever for his behaviour in the early hours of the 25th of July, then he has an argument that he hasn't grossly misconducted himself. That leaves open the question of whether there are other provisions under the clauses of the contract that would justify summary termination. Uh, my Lord drew attention to those before, such as bringing the company into distribution. Either way, that's a matter for trial, I, I, and we acknowledge that. But I'm not mentioning these points just in order to be gratuitous. They do form part of the background against which the choice as to which is the least burdensome option falls to be exercised. The defendant, as one would expect, investigated um, at a meeting, we say, uh, it's unclear, I have to say, uh, whether this is common ground or not. This is the defendant's case. A meeting on the 26th of July, the claimant uh, said that if the board was minded to remove him, he would prefer to resign through ill health rather than be dismissed. Uh, just for my Lord's reference, that's the defence at uh, paragraph 39E. On the 1st of August 2017, in the morning, the claimant resigned his employment and he asked to be released from his contractual obligation to provide notice. I know this is a document that my lords have seen already. Can I ask that we turn it up again please? It's page 283 of the supplemental bundle. Sorry. 280. Sorry, I did say 283. 280 last time we were sorry. Uh, this is, I, I think there was a suggestion earlier on that this was written by his solicitors. It's not, it's written by Mr. McKenzie himself. Um, 
Britain having Although, consulted uh, solicitors. Uh, I'm sorry? Britain having consulted solicitors. Yes, that, that, that is the case. There'd been some correspondence between solicitors acting on behalf of Mr. Mackenzie at that point uh, and uh, my clients. I just want to draw attention to uh, a point which I believe has been accentuated already in the course of, of discussions when my learned friend was on his feet. But the reason for Mr. McKenzie offering his resignation, sorry, not offering, he is, res he is resigning, is because of his ill health. I know it's being put now by Mr. Mansfield on his behalf that the reason why Mr. McKenzie is doing this is because of the way he's being treated by the company. What he's saying at this stage is that it's because of his ill health. I'm afraid I don't quite understand what my learned friend's case is in relation to this letter. And in particular, is he saying that my client could take it at face value? And if not, why not? Is he saying that there's an obvious lack of capacity which renders the contents of this letter completely unreliable? If that is his case, how can he sensibly address this court and say that this is the man who should be have the ability to influence the strategy of the AA within a matter of months. Well, the only hook he's got, he's put forward to hang Tom, is um, that your team did not actually take it seriously. They regarded it as an attempt to manipulate. Uh, 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 absolutely. That's, well, that, that leads off down a different route, but it's an answer to your question. Uh, I think. It, it, it's, 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 it is correct that my... Uh, that it was regarded, uh, and we pleaded this, as something that um, was a contrivance by Mr. McKenzie. But if we get to the point of, from a Laverack perspective, of considering whether the least burdensome option in a counterfactual universe, where Mr. McKenzie has not been dismissed for gross misconduct, then this is. Uh, an item of correspondence which has arisen prior to his dismissal, which in my submission can be relied on on the face of it. In other words, had my clients wished to do so, they could have accepted the offer. The offer in this case being resignation on immediate note, without notice at all. It's not the only piece of correspondence that uh, we need to look at. Can I ask? My Lord, just to turn to the page before, no, 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 page 279. But that's not the counterfactual, because they didn't. And they obviously didn't, because they had in mind the, the effect on the MVP share. It, that is, well, that's why, that's why it was rejected. Can I, can I take my, my Lords to a different piece of correspondence that came from Mr. McKenzie the day before? Right. Yeah. It's, the, it's a page 279. This is a letter from a psychiatrist received the day before. No, psychologist. Psych uh, forgive me, a psychologist. The critical point is the last sentence. I'm hopeful this combination should result in a significant improvement in his mental state. But for this program to be effective, Bob needs to be treated as if he has had a heart attack and take a total break from the work demands for approximately six months. How did this get to you? Was it handed in by Mr. McKenzie, sent with the first of August letters, or, or what? You know. I'll just turn my back. Yeah. It was sent by the solicitors. Sent, sent by Mr. McKenzie's solicitors. On the, on the 31st. Contemporaneous. Oh, forgive me. Contemporaneously. Yes. So either the first, first or the first. Yeah, it's it's, para it's pleaded. A para I'm grateful to Mr. Smith sitting behind me. Paragraph forty-eight of our defence. Yes. And did did, did uh, Professor Ishmael? I think he's Professor Ishmael. Did his report come at the same time? Her report, I believe, did not. Her report. Yeah. But, but I think I think I'm right about that. But um, no, that's that was Thank served you. with the amended particulars of claim. Thank you. It, but it, that does remind me of a point. I, it's a minor point, perhaps, of correction. I need. Um, to what Mr. Manfield submitted, 
you, I don't know to what extent my lords have had the opportunity of examining in detail Professor Ishmael's report, not, not, not in great deal, in detail. Yeah. Mr Mansfield did indicate before that M Mr M McKenzie had in the intervening period between the 25th of July and, and 31st of July talked about how he banged his head that that had resulted and sort of scrambled his senses on the night in question. That's a case that's been developed as part of the litigation. That's not what he said at the time. I want to be clear. I, I, I appreciate this appeal isn't going to turn on these minor differences, but I just thought it'd be appropriate for me to mention. So that was the, uh, the, the that is the position. The, the report, however, from Professor Rishmeyer, which we can read now as part of this litigation, does tend to support what is in the psychologist in as much as it confirms that Mr. McKenzie was in no fit state after the index incident. So what Professor Ishmael refers to is what she calls a decompensation after the events of the 25th of July. There's, that's referred to in Mr. Metz's, Mr. Metz QC's judgment. But in other words, after the incident on the 25th of July, according to the claimant's own expert, he effectively collapsed mentally. Indeed, has never recovered. But we, of course, know that on the 1st of August, uh, after receiving the letter that I just took you to, the board met, it rejected the claimant's offer, and he was dismissed for gross misconduct. The second element of the facts that I want to, uh, just want to address before I get into the detailed arguments relates to what it is that the claimant is claiming for in respect of his claim of wrongful dismissal. I know my lords have seen the, the pleading for loss and damage at paragraphs 42.1 to 42.3 of the amended particulars, what we call the ancillary benefit. But can I just put some numbers on that? Pension contributions at 11.7% of salary, in other words, £87,500. A car whose lease value is £1,000 per month, so that's £12,000 per annum, plus dedicated driver. Medical insurance for Mr McKenzie and his entire family. Private health insurance at the rate of 75% of salary. Say that again. Private health insurance. Sorry, permanent health insurance. I, I yes. one. Permanent, oh, forgive me. Permanent health insurance. PHI at 75% of salary. 75%? 75%. And that would that, that cut in if he became permanently disabled from working during the period of the exactly. policy. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I see. Yeah. Sorry. That, that's the benefit. Yeah. That's the benefit. Sorry, forgive me. Not the, the, value, the value is the premium. Yeah. Yeah, yes, to value secure that. that. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Yes. I'm, I'm not putting a price on it because I don't have those figures behind yeah. mine, but I just want to right. itemise yes. what the ancillary benefits claim involves. Yes. We'll itemise their value where we can, but to give the court an idea of the overall value. Yes. Uh, he has death in service benefit. I'm, it's not clear, I have to say, I have to confess, it's not clear whether that's claimed, in fact, as part of the wrongful dismissal claim. Well, uh, I mean, a basic assessment of value would be the premium. In each case, it will always be the premium, absolutely. And then there's the bonus. And uh, in the amended reply, uh, it's specifically pleaded that the defendant should have paid the claimant his full bonus for the year in respect of which he was wrongfully dismissed. And that's 120% of salary, that's £900,000. So ignoring the elements for which we don't have the sums, it's apparent that the ancillary benefits claim alone is for a sum of in excess of £1 million. Pounds. That's on top of the salary claim of £750,000, which we agree goes to trial. Now, we apply to strike out the claim for ancillary benefits on the basis that they fell outside the terms of the pylon clause. In other words, if the pylon clause is exercised by the employer, none of those ancillary benefits becomes payable. We say that that was the effect of the least burdensome 
uh, rule, at least, yeah, at least burdensome, which I'll call a rule. Now, as I understand it, Mr. McKenzie's primary argument on this appeal is that the rule should not be followed, especially in the case of wrongful dismissal, because it is anomalous and unprincipled. Um, first of all, as I think is now quite clear, that's not an argument that's available to Mr. Mansfield in this court. I'll deal with this point very briefly. The rule is of long standing. It goes back to at least Coburn and Alexander in 1848, tab one of the bundle of authorities. Since then, it has been applied on countless occasions in courts of all levels. And since the turn of the century alone, as we have seen this morning, it has been given detailed consideration by this court in uh, the BMI baby case. It has also been referred to without any suggestion that it is wrong by the majority in the House of Lords in Golden Strait. That's tab 20, see paragraph 33. I've seen my Lord Lord Justice been looking up quizzically. Yeah, is that the same as Golden Victory? Yes, it is. It? Right. It's the same case. It's tab 20. Oh, I see, yes. It's paragraph 33. It's the judgment of Lord Scott. It's the only is the only one of um, uh, the, their lordships to to refer to the Laverack principle. Did anyone agree with him? I can't remember. Oh, oh, give me my not in there. Did anyone agree with him? Yes, I was going to make the additional point. Yes, Thank they. Yes, they did. Not three, three not two. the two dissenting judges. Three, three two. No. It was three to not two dissenting judges, but the majority specifically. Scott, agreed. Carswell, and Brown. Yeah. So, and just for the for the uh, for the references, Carswell at sixty-eight, paragraph sixty-eight, Brown at eighty, paragraph eighty. So I didn't. I forgot my manners. Lords, Lord Carswell at paragraph sixty-eight, and Lord Brown at paragraph eighty-five. And then more recently, again referred to. Uh, did my lords get the reference for uh, for Lord Scott? That was paragraph thirty three. That's where it's referred to. And then more recently, uh, in by Lord Wilson in uh, an employment case, Gaze and Scott, uh, Societe Generale. Uh, that's at tab twenty seven. I'm not going to ask you to turn that up because I want to look at that in a little bit more detail shortly, if I may. Again, giving the ju uh, giving the lead judgment for the majority in that case, which was four one. In the Supreme Court, so uh, I don't. I don't want to labour this point. Any assault on the rule, obviously, can only be mounted at apex court level. Um, and uh, I, understand, well, uh, I understand, Mr. Mansfield. Talks I'm not. I'm not dissenting from that, but I'm not sure that the authorities you've identified are those that establish that. I mean, Laverack is is different from the the least burdensome rule in alternative modes of performance. Um, what, what I, I, I it's La, La, Laverack is, is authority as a matter of ratio the principle uh, that you apply the minimum contractual obligation it doesn't itself establish that where you have alternative modes of performance it's the least burdensome of the two um, nor I think do, uh, is, does Lord of Victory or Gaze Say, say anything about forgive me, it, about forgive me if I wasn't clear, my lord, as to the purpose for which I was referring to those cases. Uh, there is a long line of authorities, particularly in the 20th century, Laverack being among them, but starting earlier than that, out of the, the uh, Abrahams and Riot case, uh, and a number of employment cases to which I'm about to turn, specifically, because they deal with alternatives, which, which make the point more explicitly. The reason I've just referred to the, the um, decision in this court in the BMI baby case and the references to the Laverack principle in both the Golden Strait and, and in uh, Gies and Sopcha is to demonstrate that, that there hasn't been any serious um, criticism of the rule at a very high level. In, in any so I'm, sorry to, I'm sorry to press you, but we, we do need to be clear 
what we're describing as the rule. There's one principle, which was part of the ratio of lateral recompense, which is that uh, damages are, are calculated by reference to that which the defendant was obliged to do, not that which the defendant would in fact have done. Yeah. Simpliciter. Uh, there's a, a separate rule, or at least application of that rule, in cases of uh, alternative modes of performance, alternative options, which says it should be the damages are assessed by reference to that which is least burdensome to the defendant or most beneficial to the claimant. That was the principle expressed in Coben and Alexander uh, and so on. But that wasn't the subject matter of the decision in that work. And as I understand it, it's the second of those that we've been referring to and that you are referring to as the rule. It, it is. And that's why Forgive I was me. just pressing you, uh, which, which are the Court of Appeal and House of Lords or Supreme Court authorities where that is established as a matter of ratio. Can I, can I can answer this way? I see those as being two sides of the same coin. What my Lord has identified as two separate propositions. They're two sides of the same coin. If one starts from the position, Coburn and Alexander, that, that, um, a party is not, or, uh, that a party isn't required to do, sorry, Labra, I, I beg your pardon, that a party in a claim for damages is not to be taken as, as as having done what he was not required to do under the contract. The necessary extrapolation from that is that damages can only be assessed on the basis that he should do what's least burdensome under the contract. I, I'm, of course, responding to an appeal in this case. The highest it's put by Mr. Mansfield, I have to address it, and I, I don't, as I said, I don't intend to labour the point. The highest it's put is that the rule, by, what, by which I understand he means the rule in Laveran, and all its consequences. No, when, when pressed, he made perfectly clear that it was, it was the rule about uh, taking the least burdensome. You have my approach. position that it's effectively the same thing, but even taking it on that alternative formulation. That, that was the rule he was he was attacking. Understood. But even on that alternative formulation, my submission, and I, I believe Mr. Mansfield accepted that, that it's not open to him to uh, to invite this court not to, not to apply that rule in this case. Ultimately, his case concentrated on whether or not least burden, the least burdensome option was obvious in this case. Yes, I mean, and, and there, are, there are many dicta uh, to that effect in the authorities at the highest level, and as he accepted, none to the contrary. But, um, but when you were submitting, it was not available in this court. Um, I was just hoping you were going to identify for us those cases in which it was ratio. And I don't think any of those that you identified were cases in which it was ratio at all. Uh, no, the ones that I've identified. I'm, I'm, can I can I now go to um, what well, sticking with the general the principle first of all. So I, I want to demonstrate this, if I may, my lord, by reference to wrongful dismissal cases. This is a wrongful dismissal case, and it seems to me that that's the, the, the best way to start to, to address my lord's question. Right. Um, my lord, forgive me if I come back to the question that my lord has answered uh, has asked me. I've, we don't just rely on the number of authorities in which the Laverack principle or the Coburn and Alexander principle, if it's distinct, has been identified, followed, uh, uh, and recited. We say, as a matter of principle, that the rule makes perfect sense. That was the observation of Lord Hoffman in Lyon, Nathan and C.C. Butler's, see tab 9 uh, of the Bundle of Authorities Privy Council decision. Well, I wanted to keep picking away at the same saw, but <laughs> if you're talking about the rule, can, can we adopt this shorthand, less burdensome alternative, where there are two alternatives, which you say this... Yep. And let's call it minimum performance, where in, in, in the single obligation type of case, so 
conscious, the um, seller who can deliver a certain quantity, 5% more or less. I mean, it may be that you say that the result is the same, yeah. but uh, when, when you speak of the rule, I think we, we, we need to be clear what shorthand you're using. Yeah. So I, I, I'm talking about the former. The, the less burdensome of two alternatives. Absolutely. Least burdensome of three alternatives. Yeah, yeah. Pro yes. pro provided there's more than one alternative. Right. The question is identifying the yes. least burdensome. Uh, of the so, well, can I take my lords to the, the Lion Nathan and C.C. Bonner's <coughs> case? Yes. This was a, this, a case where. It, sorry, it's, I, I should have made it clear. It's tab nine. Internal page numbering, page 1446. Case where uh, the, um, ultimately the Privy Council decided that the rule, by which I mean the least onerous alternative, was not applicable on the facts of that case. But we can see that it, between D and E, Lord Hoffman's speech, he discusses Labarat and then Paula Lee and Robert Zeher. If we can pick it up two lines above F, it's well settled that the court will assume that the defendant would have performed those obligations in the way least onerous to himself. If his duty was to act reasonably, it will be assumed that from various reasonable methods of performance, he would have chosen the one least unfavourable to himself. All this makes perfectly good sense when damages depend on a prediction of how the defendant would have performed outstanding contractual obligations which gave him a choice of what to do. But this is not such a case. Lord Hoffman observes that the rule makes perfectly good sense. That is consistent with the analysis of this court in BMI Baby, in particular the judgment of Lord Justice Patton, Paragraph 63 and 64. I'm, I'm not inviting my lords to turn it up because I know you had it open earlier on, but my lords may well recall that Lord Justice Patton said that the rule, well, I, I forget the precise word, sensible, because it prevents damages being assessed on a fictional or arbitrary basis. the least onerous alternative is also a rule which is followed in other common law jurisdictions and we've included in the bundle of authorities enthusiastic endorsements of the rule from uh, the Supreme Court of Canada in the Hamilton and Open Window Bakery case, that's tab 18 And from uh, New Zealand in the Paper Reclaim and Outer, Outer Roa case, tab 22. Both of these are termination cases. Tab 22, sir. Yes, tab 22. Thank you. I, I, I'm not proposing to take my, my lords to, to those authorities, though I pay particular tribute to the um, analysis of the Supreme Court of Canada in the Hamilton and Open Window Bakery case, which uh, I think spawned one of the articles. Mr. Mansfield uh, has remarked. Um, Mr. Mansfield, at paragraph 34 of his skeleton argument, mounts an attack on the rule by pointing to various decisions which he says carve out exceptions render its continued application, especially in wrongful dismissal cases, anomalous. 
we've answered those criticisms at paragraph 29 of our skeleton argument, and unless I'm invited to do so, I'm not proposing to go through those again. I noticed that they weren't particularly pressed by Mr Mansfield when he was on his feet. And that brings me to wrongful dismissal claims. Uh, and for, forgive me, especially for my Lord or Justice Bean, for whom I know this is absolutely basic stuff. Uh, uh, but it may be worth just reminding ourselves what a claim for wrongful dismissal is. It is a claim, we submit, that the employment has been prematurely terminated. The measure of damages for such a claim in cases without a pylon clause is the sum payable during the notice period. Um, we haven't included these cases in the authorities bundle. Mr Smith and I our researches indicate that although the, the phrase wrongful dismissal wasn't used, the, the cause of action developed in, from around 1840. Coincidentally, around the same time that the courts began to articulate the rule in Coburn and Alexander, 1848. My lords will have seen from our skeleton argument that we have submitted that the least onerous obligation rule is baked into a claim for wrongful dismissal. It is an inherent part of it. Because damages are necessarily limited to the extent of the notice period. My lord or Justice Popperwell pressed Mr Mansfield this morning as to how that Fitted, how his attack on the overall principle fitted in his pleaded case, limiting his damages to 12 months. And Mr Mansfield's answer was that that was compelled by the decision, uh, decisions in Johnson and Unisys and Edwards and Chesterfield. But with respect, that's not a satisfactory explanation, because it has always been the case that wrongful dismissal claims have been limited to the notice period. Well, more accurately limited to benefits which the claimant would have received during the notice period. M more actually, so I was using a short If there's a sort of annual bonus um, uh, due to everybody who was there and, uh, at a particular time, then... Yeah, well, I accept that. It's not just salary. But it, it is absolutely not just yeah. salary. This case is a good example. We accept, for example, yes. if the claimant succeeds, he gets his holiday pay. Yeah. Um, and... There'll be, other, there'll be cases where um, someone's been able to claim for loss of, uh, loss of the opportunity to earn a commission, to receive tips. There are, it, it, there absolutely, it's not our case. It's well, the counterfactual cannot be, I don't think Mr Mansfield queries this, how could he? The counterfactual cannot be that if you had not wrongfully dismissed me, I would have stayed with you for the rest of my career. I, I, indeed, and that's, uh, that's very important research. It's, it's really important because there will no doubt be countless cases where in the real world counterfactual, if the employer had appreciated that its dismissal was, would have been wrongful, it would not have dismissed at all, as per our footnote. The rainmaker, brilliant employee who's wrongly, um, uh, accused of, uh, wrongly accused of being a thief and found to be a thief and who is dismissed. One, one's heart bleeds for the individual, but his his compensation or his damages claim is limited to the notice period in the contract. That's always been the case. There are claims of wrongful dismissal. And the, the philosophy that underpins that feature of our common law is that a claim is that an employer is only liable in a wrongful dismissal claim for such monies as, as he would have had to have paid to the employee during the period where he was obliged to employ him, I, I think you're submitting, as I put to Mr. Mansfield, that that's simply an application of the least burdensome 
performance rule. And uh, no doubt in almost every case, uh, it would be regarded as the least burdensome thing for a, an employer to do in the counterfactual, uh, which, which would be to uh, give the shortest period of notice and terminate as soon as possible. But it wouldn't necessarily be so, would it? If you, if you take your example of dismissal for gross misconduct as a result of mistaken identity, you have a most valued employee uh, who's accused of stealing and uh, uh, it's uh, after an inquiry he's dismissed for gross misconduct and then it becomes apparent that it wasn't him at all yep. um, now wh why could it not be said in that case well actually in the counterfactual the least burdensome method of the employer performing the contract would have been to keep him on so that he continued to earn vast sums in commission for the company is there an example of, of that kind of case where that hasn't been the result? Where that hasn't been the result? Yeah. So I'm f sorry. I'm, I, I, no, so I, 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 I can quite see that in most, most employment cases, you are going to say least burdensome means uh, earliest termination. Uh, but if, it is a, if, it, if those are, in fact, an application of the principle, one can posit certain facts in which it wouldn't, in what? fact, that wouldn't, in fact, be the least burdensome. No, indeed. So, uh, and what I'm asking is, are there any employment cases you're going to show us where that's, as it were, treated as a separate rule for employment contracts, irrespective of that not being the least burdensome mode of conduct of the employer? Um, if I follow my Lord's question correctly, yeah. I, think I'm, I think the answer to that question is no, I'm not going to show you any cases where, yeah. where that's been tested. Um, I can, we haven't got it in the bundle, but in the Edwards and uh, I mean, but there, there are any number of cases, Edwards and Chesterfield is one that comes to mind, where a, a, a brilliant surgeon is dismissed. Effectively, it, it was a, it, it, it's, a, it's a gross misconduct dismissal, but it's a wrongful dismissal. It's got it, they got it right. It's, it's not somebody who's generating lots of commission, because it's a, it's a public authority employer. <coughs> but on any view, it's an, un, it's an unjust outcome. But the, but the remedy is limited to the notice period. So there's any number of cases where whilst the, the man on the street might say, well, that's an unjust outcome, application of... Well, it's not a question of it's an unjust outcome. I, I, I quite understand that often in employment cases you can start from the proposition in the counterfactual that they wanted to dismiss him whether they were entitled to or not. And that, that then means least burdensome mode of performance would, would be minimum, minimum period of further, further employment. Quite understand that, but the kind of case we're positing is, or I'm positing, is, is uh, no doubt very unusual in which that wouldn't necessarily be, be so. I, I'm, all, all I'm doing really is, I'm sorry, I'm rambling, but I, I'm, I'm wondering whether there's some special rule that you're suggesting in employment cases, you uh, or whether this what, is not just what, just just what, simply it, it, application of the of the principle. What, this is why I drew attention to the fact that the wrongful dismissal regime. I said it wasn't called that, actually predated Coburn and Alexander. Because uh, whilst on one view it could be said it's that the wrongful dismissal practice is simply an illustration of the, of the, of the rule in its ordinary application, it may well be that wrongful dismissal developed as a cause of action slightly before it, and the two have coalesced somewhat in the, in the subsequent 180 years. For the avoidance of doubt, and I'm going to make this good by reference to a number of authorities. Our principal proposition is that as a matter of law, in a wrongful dismissal claim, the court is directed to establishing the earliest date upon which the employer could lawfully have terminated under the contract. Even in a case where that yes. is not uh, yes. the least burdensome mode of performance? That is the sole inquiry of my submission. So it's not a, it's not it's not an example of the application of the rule. It's a separate rule that applies in employment. That's cases. our primary case. It's, it's not an example of the rule. It's a, it is it rises above it. But if I'm wrong about that, then it's merely an application of the rule. But I, I, I'm slightly taking my submissions out of turn. But there's an additional reason 
why in the example that my Lord posits, which we're not shrinking from because we've, we put it in our own skeleton argument in a, in a footnote, the brilliant employee mistakenly identified as a thief, could not, in my submission, even if one was able to establish to a compelling degree that it wasn't the least burdensome option, dismiss, could not bring a claim that has the effect of lifting the notice period as the ceiling on his, on, on, on his claim for contractual damages, because that would infringe the parallel statutory regime for employment protection that Parliament has erected. So there is a good reason for thinking that employment cases are in a slightly different position from other contractual cases. And it's because of the existence of the, of the Johnson uh, and Unisys exclusion. Right? The existence of a separate mechanism for employment rights to be protected. And indeed, my lords may recall that that, I appreciate we slightly, uh, um, this wasn't a matter that Mr. Mansfield particularly highlighted when he was going through the Smith and Trafford case, the decision of Mr. Justice Briggs. Mm. But at paragraphs, I think, 99 to 100 of Mr. Justice Briggs, the young one, his decision in that case. He referred to the Johnson and Unisys exclusion zone. In my submission, he was right to do so. Just translate Johnson and Unisys exclusion zone into um, uh, ordinary language. Uh, um, the existence of a statutory regime for employment protection, for employment rights protection, and in particular, an unfair dismissal regime. Is taken to represent Parliament's intention that uh, complaints about uh, dismissal should primarily be uh, considered and adjudicated upon by employment tribunals and specialist tribunals set up in order to achieve that task, and that contractual claims relating to dismissal should not be allowed to, uh, should not exceed um, their settled parameters and effectively leach into claims that ought best to be dealt with as unfair dismissal claims. I'm sure I've mangled that somewhat. But I, uh, yeah, well, I, I see what you're saying, but I, 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 mean, I would put it the other way around. And, and even Laverack and, and Woods of Colchester, let alone 19th century cases, date from a time pre 1970 where the, the, there was no statutory um, uh, right to complain to a tribunal yeah. of unfair dismissal or, or discrimination or lots of other things. And all that the servant had under the old law, the master and servant, was the right to sue for wrongful dismissal, which I think you're right in saying was simply the, the, the right to be paid what was due un under whatever notice provision the contract had. Yeah. I have a few special cases like um, seafarers where it's the duration of the voyage, but, but by and large, that's the only remedy that the, that the servant has. And it's because that is so unfair in many cases that Parliament introduced the statutory remedies in, in the in the nine in the nineteen seventies. Well, I, 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 forgive me, I didn't yeah. interrupt. Since, you, so. since when, as House of Lords said in Johnson and Unisys, um, um, things which are not claims under the contract are best brought in the um, employment tribunal. Well, uh, as as ever, I'm, I'm grateful to my lords. Uh, Familiarity with the better familiarity with the history. I, it's a, I accept it's a, it's a more accurate way of, of depicting the historical evolution of, 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 the, of the two separate regimes. Um, but it's an, it, to answer my Lord, my Lord, Lord, Lord Justice Popwell's question, I am specifically submitting that that there is a, an element of our case in, un, under which employment contracts are sui generis. What's, that, the, and what's the justification for that? The existence, the existence now in 2022. Well, what, 
of, of I would say the, the justification for that now is Johnson and Unisys. Yeah, absolutely. Which so I'm afraid I don't really follow. Well, I, I, all, I, all the Johnson it, and Unisys says is all you can get in your contractual claim is that which you're entitled to by way of a contractual claim, which is governed by the previous hmm. case law and principles of contract. My lord, it may be that I don't need to go any further than that. The truth is, it, it, it's not necessary for me to draw to drive a wedge between employment cases and uh, the least onerous um, alternative. I mean, employment cases aren't of a particular kind in being, uh, as I think you put it, um, a claim for the contract that's prematurely terminated. That's usually the case in a repudiation of all sorts of contracts. <laughs> and it, one has to indeed, determine yeah. how long they would have gone on for. And it's fair to and basis you do it. I accept that, my lord. And indeed, in Sockgen and, and Gaines, which we'll come to, um, attempts to. Uh, before the Supreme Court to, to put employment contracts on a different footing as far as re repudiation of contract concern, uh, was concerned, failed by a four, by 4-1 four uh, majority. Um, so it, I, I, I do want to emphasise it. it isn't necessary for my case. Nonetheless, there is in my submission a very clear stream of case law specifically on the question of wrongful dismissal and the damages available in contract in, in the uh, for wrongful dismissal, it makes it clear, going back to my initial proposition, that the task of the court is to look at the earliest date upon which the contract can have been terminated. Right, so I, I, I guess you were about to show us the authorities yeah. that, that established that proposition as a, an employment case. Uh, and let me state, state by way of starters, I accept that Lavrec isn't one of them. You know, Lavrec, La Lavrec's authority for an allied principle, an allied proposition, but it's not a wrongful dismissal case. So, uh, Gunson at tab six, first of all. And first of all, if you take it, please. At at page 7772, seven, seven, Judgment of Lord Justice Buckley. An F in the copy of the report. Where a servant is wrongfully dismissed, he is entitled, subject to mitigation, to damages equivalent to the wages he would have earned under the contract from the date of dismissal to the end of the contract. The date when the contract would have come to an end, however, must be ascertained on the assumption that the employer would have exercised any power he may have had to bring the contract to an end in the way most beneficial to himself. That is to say that he would have determined the contract at the earliest date at which he could properly do so. To similar effect, Lord Justice Brightman at page 776 Picking up an F, an employee's remedy if he is unlawfully dismissed by his employer is damages. There's then an explanation about the unavailability of specific performance as a remedy. I can pick it up again adjacent to the top of the sideline. By, nece by necessity, his remedy is confined to damages. An unlawful dismissal is ex hypothesi a premature dismissal. The damages recoverable, having regard to the plaintiff's duty to mitigate his damages, are the monies needed to compensate the plaintiff his net loss of salary or wages during the period which the defend defendant was bound by his contract to employ the plaintiff. In the case of a fixed term contract, the assessment will extend over that fixed term. In the case of a contract terminable by notice, the assessment will extend over the period which would have had to elapse before the defendant could lawfully have dismissed the plaintiff. Uh, in uh, my learned friend's skeleton argument, they say that uh, the court should be wary about placing reliance on court of appeal in Gunton because the only citation, the, uh, there's no citation of Laverack style authority, many McGregor on damages at uh, the 13th edition. Um, we can put those copies of pages 884 to 888 of the 13th edition before the court if you think it would be helpful. But um, it's of a piece with McGregor nowadays in terms of reciting the relevant case law in this area. As, as I'm sure one would not be surprised uh, to hear. In any
any event. We say that's ratio. It's, it's clear as to the direction which a court must take in cases of wrongful dismissal. Um, well, it's ratio certainly so far as well, Justice Buckley is concerned because, if and because, that would be uh, exercising the power to bring the contract to an end in the way most beneficial to himself, which will no doubt what was obviously the case in this case and will usually be the case. Yeah. Uh, that, it would suggest rather the opposite of there being a, a different rule from Coburn and Alexander, which that expresses, applicable in employment cases willy-nilly, even if that isn't what's most beneficial to him. So, um, my Lord asked me before if I thought we were going to show any cases where, the, where, where we're looking at the, a, a, a type of event such as the kind that my Lord posited or that we put in our footnote in our state and argument. Can, uh, the answer to that is no, but uh, over 140 years of I've got my maths wrong, 180 odd years of, um, of wrongful dismissal case law. Um, not pretending to have conducted an entirely exhaustive analysis of it, but, but I, I'm unaware of any case in which a court has lifted the cap on the notice period on the basis that it has been contended that the least onerous obligation um, in that particular case was simply to retain the employee in employment ad infinitum, or at any rate beyond the notice period, beyond the contractual notice period. Once, once notice is lawfully given, and there are cases about whether there was a contractual entitlement to have a certain procedure followed before notice is given. It's part and parcel of the same rule. You're still trying to identify the minimum period yes. during which the over which the employer is bound to keep the employee in their employment. One thing that one point that is worth making at this stage, because of course historically there was, in some cases, a contractual notice period. In other cases, no notice period in the contract at all. So it's a matter for the common law to decide what a reasonable notice period was. Statute then took over, and so minimum periods of notice are now imposed as a matter of statute under the Employment Rights Act. But a relatively recent innovation, I'm not suggesting it was invented yesterday, is the pylon rule. I mean, the cases from the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century don't involve pylon clauses because they simply reflect more sophisticated, complicated way about going, of going about drafting employment contracts. So it's not terribly surprising that none of the cases specifically reflect the case that we're involved. Of course, the House of Lords in Delaney and Staples had to deal with um, pylon clauses in a different context, but and we've cited that in our skeleton argument. We needn't turn it up. But but pylon clauses were designed to lawfully provide the employer with a means of terminating even sooner than the standard notice period. Of course, there's a price for doing so. You've got to make a payment in lieu. But it's designed, it's a clause design, whose very essence is to achieve a very swift resolution of the contract of employment relationship. It also means, doesn't it, that if, if an employer dismisses using the pylon clause, but still doesn't want the employee to go and work for competition, the any restrictive covenants subject to reasonableness and so on may be enforceable. Yeah. Whereas if there's no pylon clause, a um, summary dismissal for gross misconduct may be argued to be, um, or summary dismissal for any reason or no reason, can be treated as a repudiation um, by the employer, and so the restrictive Strict covenants go up in flames, whether they're reasonable or not. It, the, by the employee, I think it can be it can be treated as repudiated by the employee. I think, yeah. Well, no, no repudiation no, by the employer re can sorry, be treated yeah, by the employee the thing, yes, sorry, as a repudiation yeah, by yeah, the yeah. employer. Yeah, absolutely. So, the wrong, a wrongful dismissal uh, ends up uh, incinerating the uh, restrictive covenants that would otherwise be reasonable and enforceable. Yeah. 
um, whereas of course terminating in accordance with the pylon clause um, won't have that effect. There's a separate investigation as to whether or not post-termination restraints can be enforced. Um, but, but, but it is your submission, is it, if I understood correctly, that because a pylon clause leads to an earlier termination and the rule is that it's the earlier state of termination which must necessarily be taken in an employment case, uh, that exercise of the pylon is always a counterfactual, even if that would not be in the best interest of the employer. Yes. Because that's the logic of your argument. Yes. Even where that would actually be a more burdensome and less beneficial uh, course and might be seen as cutting off his nose to spite his face, even in those circumstances, uh, where the employee is about to go let's say there are no restrictive covenants, about to go and, and join the main rival. I think, I think it is the logic of your submission that, that because a pylon clause could, results in the earliest termination, that has to be the counterfactual, even if I'm more burdensome. I'm not away from it, Michael. Yes, yes. That, is our, that is our position. Because there's and a special rule for, for, because, for contracts because that's of employment. The because absolutely the, the authority... That, that wouldn't be the case for anything... I, other than contracts of employment, but you say that is the rule for contracts. Uh, uh, that's our primary position, and our fallback position is that it's ordinarily the case, because in almost every case, the 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 pylon clause will obviously provide you with the answer to what's the least burdensome uh, least burdensome alternative. And can I at this point deal with my lord's uh, alternative of the individual who's going to the rival? The employer has already dismissed them. There's, the claim is for wrongful dismissal. So if we put in the realms of the, of, the, of the counterfactual, one has to proceed from the starting point that the employer has already decided that they want to rupture the relationship. Yes. And they can do that by putting someone on guard and leave for you. So that's, that, that doesn't tell you which of those two options they would choose to exercise. But they factored it. it uh, well, the, um, when one comes to consider, if indeed one comes to consider, which is the least burdensome alternative? My Lord asked uh, Mr Mansfield earlier on about whether it's a subjective test or an objective test. I think Mr Mansfield, after a, a, a little thought, said it was an objective test. And we don't, we don't disagree with him in relation to that. How, but subject to this gloss, it's not how the reasonable employer would do it. It's how the reasonable employer with the characteristics of this employer would do it, knowing that this employer has already demonstrated its intention to dismiss summarily, which is a critical aspect of setting up the counterfactual. That's what's so neat about a pylon clause in the context of a wrongful dismissal claim. When, one, when the employer, as my client is doing, is seeking to limit damages, it's saying, even assuming that the wrongful dismissal claim is well founded, damages should be assessed by reference to us operating a clause that provides us with absolutely the same outcome that we achieved anyway, albeit on payment of uh, seven hundred and fifty thousand pounds for salary. Why, why do you, why do you need to take into account what you? placed heavy emphasis on in the knowledge that you've already dismissed. It isn't I mean and you may be you may be right in contracts, but that's not how you'd approach it in other fields. In tort you you would say what the counterfactual would be, what would have happened if the tort hadn't occurred. Hadn't occurred. You wouldn't say, well, being overturned on this, but you you wouldn't you wouldn't say uh, the counterfactual is to be assessed on the basis that the tort has occurred or would have occurred. No, but uh, can I can I pray and aid here something that's said by Lord Justice Russell in Laverack? Uh, he said an employer who has already demonstrated that it's prepared, this is when considering the, the least, the, the, the least um, burdensome principle. The employer 
who has already demonstrated that it's, that, it's, that it's willing to terminate the employment relationship summarily is, quote unquote, an unlikely source of future generosity. Yes, he does say that. So, so, so we can't reset the clock entirely and pretend that the that this is an employer that doesn't want to terminate at all. This is, but this is setting up a, a completely different basis for the principle that you are submitting. It, th this is setting up the principle on the basis that the employer wants to get rid of them, and that's that's not not the stated basis for either the rule that we've been talking about with Mansfield or your extended rule of um, what's the quickest way you can get rid of him lawfully it, 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 I, I, I don't with respect I don't, I, I don't see why um, it, it, it's inconsistent that position well all. it's one thing to say that as a matter of contract you've engaged in certain obligations and therefore your the, the, the counterfactual is the minimum that you that would have meant you you discharged your contractual obligations. The, the con the you don't you don't need a an, a prior decision to get rid of the person, and it feeds into my Lord Lord Justice Popwell's question, where with the the super duper employee who's been wrongly identified, to which my private reaction was, well, you'd just take him back on. <laughs> well, well, mine too, uh, which, uh, which which is not a is not a legal argument, but, no. but but it may be partly a reason why there aren't any cases which deal with that that particular outturn of events. But I, I I simply don't know enough about the area to know whether that's the, right or not. The um, it would be uh, it, that may be an explanation for some cases. It's unlikely to be an, ex an explanation for all. Indeed, Smith and Trafford. I, 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 there's no point speculating. Yeah, okay. I, I, I take my I take my lord's point on it. The, the it, wrong wrongful dismissal is a claim for premature termination. So you're complaining about the unlawful exercise of a power to terminate. So the exercise when exploring how damages should be assessed is wondering how the power to terminate could have lawfully been exercised. Does that answer my lord's question? I put it if I if I phrase it in that way, which is yeah, why yeah. the yes. The then then we're back on to relative terra firma of the two <laughs> different two different variants that my lord or Justice Popwell has, has identified, particularly this Mansfield about alternative alternative performance and uh, least burdensome outcome. It it may be a convenient moment actually at that point to have a look at the, the next authority that I was planning to to look at, which is something that um. That Mr. Mansfield prayed in aid in his skeleton argument, which he didn't refer to on his feet. And that's the case of Rigby and Ferodo. Oh yes, well that's a f that's a famous case. But but um, that that's continuing co um, uh, employers purport to impose a wage reduction. Exactly. Employer yeah. employees work on under protest. And all he gets is the difference. And sue for the sue for the difference. The contract, it, it's uh, an, un, an un, unaccepted repudiation is a thing writ in water. Save that if they've dismissed, you can't get specific performance for contract em employment. But they didn't dismiss, so they they, dismiss. the the unaccepted repudiation was neither here nor there, and they were entitled to sue for the difference. Quite a straightforward the case. Mm, so it's quite, it, looking back on it, it's quite a straightforward case. Yes. It? And um, it's at tab seven of the bundle. Yes. Well, does it help us very much? Uh, it may. It may help a little in relation yeah, to the yeah. question that I've just endeavoured to to uh, uh, to answer. I may be wrong about that. Um, it, can I can I invite my lord to turn up page one hundred and twenty-four? Sorry, uh, sorry, it's page thirty-five. I'm so sorry. Yes. It's uh, the, the only speech is given by Lord Oliver. The the. Uh, the employers ran a series of increasingly outlandish arguments, <laughs> and the and the employees' council wasn't called upon in the end. But can I take it up at G, which is the the the, the final plea for help 
from uh, the mm. from appellate counsel. Finally, it's been argued that Mr. Rigby's claim is a claim for damages rather than death, and the ordinary rule in actions for damages for breach of contract applies. That is to say, that where a defendant has two methods of performing his contract, he must be taken to have selected that which is most favourable to him. And then there's an explanation of how the argument runs. Remembering, just for you points it out, this is a claim for non-payment of wages during employment by a non-dismissed employee, a, a, a point which Lord yeah. Oliver um, dealt with over the page, five lines down, on either view, that's to say the question of whether it's a claim for damages or debt, the argument advanced is, in my judgment, based on a fallacy. It assumes the very proposition which has already been rejected, namely that the employment under the contract of service has come to an end. If it had, then no doubt, there would be room for an inquiry at what date the employer could first lawfully have terminated him. But that is not the case with which this appeal is concerned. So one can I appreciate it's, it's, it's brief reasoning. It's uh, um, Lord Oliver perhaps running out of patience with the arguments that were being advanced on behalf of the employer in that particular case. But one can see that the question of what happened frames the assessment of damages. It does, but it's it's on the left-hand side of the equation. On the left-hand side of the equation is you've terminated the employment unlawfully. So the, the counterfactual is has to create the difference for which compensation flows. And the counterfactual is that you terminate the employment lawfully. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, well, how do you do that? And if you could have done it with a pylon clause, or you could have done it on six months notice, or could have done it in some other way, then you, you say, well, the contractual obligation is no greater than the most beneficial. And you, you've got a way into all of them, which is, which is, again, I think, is rather different from tort, because you created your own obligations by the contract. Now, at the moment, I don't think we need to be, have to be much more complicated than that. And I think I only pick, tried to pick up on this because I understood you to be emphasising the, 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 the fact that it had already been terminated. And I accept that you wouldn't have a counterfactual, to, you wouldn't be looking for a counterfactual if you didn't, hadn't already. But a bit like Lord Justice Russell, I don't think you need... My, my present understanding is you don't really need to go into the inclination of the employer, which may deal with my Lord Lord Justice Popwell's special employer. But, but, but what you just do is you're looking at the counterfactual. It's very simple. It's a pure question of contract. You've terminated unlawfully. What was your contractual obligation? Well, your, easy, your contractual obligation was no more than to, con than to terminate lawfully. Full stop. Am I, am I being too simple, or am I completely missing the point? No, no, I, on the contrary, I absolutely agree with that. And what that does is, because, because the starting point is that there has been a termination, is it excludes the possibility of looking at operating the contract in a way that doesn't involve a termination. I accept that. that, that, that if that, that was that what you were submitting, then I've been rather slow to get to it. I'm, I, I'm sure it's my fault, my name, in, 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 in terms of expression. Don't be so sure. Well, after that exchange of compliments, um, <laughs> would, when when you get to the point where where you would be moving on to a, a new topic, we can uh, uh, draw stamps for the day. But if if you if you want to finish off this this bit of the uh, of the case, then do. Well, um, I, I did say I would take uh, the court to the Guise case. The Guise oh yes, let, let's case. just look at uh, let's um, look at that as you. Prefer. It, it, this is 27. Thank you. I've read this countless, countless times down the years, and each time I have to, have to wrap, a, wrap a, a cold, wet towel around my head to, pop, to, 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 to get my head into the reasoning. Now, this, of course, is a case which concerned the hackneyed, especially my lord, the, the hackneyed um, problem of whether, especially in employment contracts, the elective or automatic theory of repudiation applies. Uh, the matter was re resolved for once and all by a 
uh, majority in, in the Supreme Court, the assumption in the minority. Oh, there are a number of issues that arose in the case. The principal, as I say, was the elective automatic controversy, where the principal speech on behalf of the majority was given by Lord Wilson, and uh, with whom Lords, uh, Lord Hope, Baroness Hale, and uh, Lord Carnworth agreed. Can I take uh, my Lords to internal page 549? Uh, and uh, paragraph 64 of uh, Lord Wilson's speech. Uh, in light of the fact that a central incident of the automatic theory is that upon the automatic termination of the contract, the innocent party has a right to damages, the first question must be whether it matters if the contract is terminated forthwith upon repudiation or instead survives until some further terminating event. The answer is that sometimes it does matter. It depends on the terms of the contract. We can skip over the next few lines and pick it up halfway between F and G. In some cases, an award of damages will compensate the employee for any such loss. Then this, but often it will fail to do so. Such failure flows from application of the least burdensome principle, namely that damages should reflect only the losses sustained by the employer's decision to repudiate the contract unlawfully rather than by his having hypothetically proceeded in the manner least profitable to the plaintiff and least burdensome to the defendant to terminate the contract lawfully. See Coburn and Alexander. And then this. So where under the terms of the contract it had been open to the wrongfully repudiating employer to have taken a course which would have terminated the contract quickly as well as lawfully, the damages will be small. Now, I, I, I'm conscious that this isn't a wrongful dismissal case. Scott Jane Gage isn't. A con I, I see my the, the my lord is 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 perhaps of the same mind in relation to this. It, it's important not to invest too much importance into these in, into these words. But it's in my su submission significant that the Supreme Court dealing with questions of specific relevance to employment contracts recognise that the test for damages for wrongful dismissal is to essentially find the swiftest route to a lawful termination entirely consistent with the test that in my submission has applied since time immemorial but on the assumption that that is the least burdensome way of performing, because that's the principle that's invoked here, and that's the principle that was invoked in Gunther and so on, for that being the, the usual result. But that, it's, it's, sorry, it's, it's, speaking for myself, I find it difficult to see the force of your submission that uh, language talking about first lawful termination or quick termination is intended to carve out a special rule for contracts of employment, which is uh, contrary to the Coburn and Alexander principle, when the Coburn and Alexander principle is expressly cited as the justification for the proposition that's being put forward. I mean, that is what you're saying. You're saying, although Coburn and Alexander is relied on here, for example, to say you look at uh, whether the, how the contract would have been terminated quickly, uh, in fact, that applies even where Coburn and Alexander wouldn't well, produce that result. Just so that it's clear, and I'm, I'm sure this is my fault, um, our position is that one is never allowed to look at events extraneous to the contract, such as the, the potential outperformance of the employee had he or she been retained on board. Even if, in a real-world factual scenario, one could say, "Well, that's that—that that, that is the the impact of." Uh, forgive me. In a real-world scenario, the employer would not have dismissed if they appreciated the dismissal uh, was wrongful. So you're never allowed to look at matters extraneous to the contract. Is that your submission? 
in, re, in, re, in, in terms of in wrongful dismissal claim, retaining, um, lifting the cap on the notice period. So well, one, one couldn't therefore take account of the fact that the employers wanted to dismiss him anyway? Couldn't. No. I don't, if, if the proposition you've just put forward is correct, that's extraneous to the terms of the contract. That seems to be conflict. I think you, I think you should think about that, Mr. Laddy, possibly overnight. It seems to me tremendously sweeping. I'll think about it overnight. Um, yes. You you say Jay's and Sock Jen is not a, a wrongful dismissal case. It is a short one. It is, it is and it isn't, isn't it? Um, the, 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 it's a whether there's a dismissal case. Sorry, it's a it's a case about whether there's a dismissal, and if so, when yes. it take place. Yes. Um, was the effective date the eighteenth of December, two thousand and seven, or not till um, sixth or seventh of January two thousand and eight? Yeah, a lot. Uh, there was a seven million odd pounds that turned. No, no, no. Of course, <laughs> of course that's that's why it uh, got to the Supreme Court with with such an all star cast. Of course, but but um, it, it, does, it, does it matter for the purpose of this analysis that it's not a wrongful dismissal claim? Yeah. I mean, you 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 rely on paragraph sixty four of Lord Wilson as. A, Expressing the, the general principle. Yeah, the last sentence in particular, we say, expresses the position. And, and it goes beyond, in my submission, simply an assumption that in most cases, uh, terminating the most speedily will be the least burdensome. That's, that's not the language that Lord Wilson uses. So he was wrong to use the word so at the beginning of the final sentence. Where the final sentence is said to follow from the Coburn and Alexander principle. It's what it's the, it's the way that he understands the uh, Coburn and Alexander principle operating in the context of wrongful dismissal claims, which is why the last clause that he uses, the damages will be small. It's not maybe or will often be, but will be small. Yes, right. Thank you very much, Mr. Laddy. Um, 10 30 tomorrow. Can you give us any estimate of how much longer you'll be? I know you, you will think, even if you can't say it, it depends how, how often we interrupt. But um, just on, a, um, on, on your best estimate. An hour? It, it, provided, it, provided that's not regarded as setting stone. Um, obviously, I'll take time to think about some of the questions that have been asked over the yes. course of the last few hours. But, um, yes. I, I'd hope to be no more than 60 minutes. Thank you.
Pani Marszałek.